If we went to war tomorrow, we would expect the first thing to do would be to defend the airspace. Man, battle station. Die, die. Do most of the men on the ship know at any given time where they are? No, they don't. The last thing we want is war. I want them to know that we're ready to go anytime. Oh. If I'm called to war, and if I have to turn those keys, I can do that. I don't think people in Washington understand exactly what to do. I'd like to let the public know that we're really not a bunch of warmongers. What we're doing out here, we're paying for the price of freedom. There's no doubt about it. American men and women, all over the world, defending our way of life. What are we willing to pay in lives and in dollars to make sure our children grow up free? And if there's a crisis or we're threatened or attacked, what can we do about it? Early Warning is brought to you by Head & Shoulders because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And by the Discover card. It pays to discover. The card that pays you back. Out in the Pacific, the belly of the USS Germantown opens wide. An LCAC landing craft air cushion slides from its wet garage. It's uh, kind of like flying a helicopter over water. $23 million worth of LCAC comes from over the horizon with men and weapons. Once again, the Marines take the beach. Overhead, 200 Marines from the 9th Regiment. Their mission? Chopper into hostile territory. A U.S. Embassy is under siege. American lives are at stake. <laughs> Our men and women of the Marines, Air Force, Army, and Navy, what do they do every day to defend against threats of nuclear attack or conventional war and third world crises? Our leaders say even though we're talking with the Russians, we must be prepared. We took our cameras halfway around the world and saw things that most people have never seen. This is actually a Marine exercise at Camp Pendleton near San Diego. Even the rioters are Marines. Some here have faced this kind of situation before and may again. That's why everyone appears to be playing for keeps. Yeah. 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 The Marine Corps, uh, you got to prove yourself. And I like the idea of proving myself. I don't like something given on a silver platter. I got hit in the face a few times with eggs. That was hard for me with standing in line getting uh, things thrown at me at point blank range and not being able to do anything about it. Many of our leaders, even generals and admirals, told me we could have better defense for less money. We shouldn't have to spend 26 cents of every dollar we pay in federal tax for defense. So what are we doing right or wrong? What do we need to get the job done? It starts here. Certainly you have to maintain the forcible entry. You've got to be able to go into harm's way and do what has to be done in a hostile kind of an environment, and that's what we're all about. Man told me using the military to solve an international problem is like using a hatchet to do surgery. Even so, the job of our Marines, Air Force, Navy, and Army is to be so good at fighting that no enemy would dare attack because they'd be convinced they didn't have a prayer of winning. That's deterrence. If we're strong enough so that nobody can ever go to the General Secretary of the Soviet Union and say, I figured out a way to attack the United States with nuclear weapons and get away with it. If we can see that no one could ever do that, then we are successful. Skybury, this is the staff command center with the test of the primary alert system. This is the underground command center, a war room, really. The people of the Strategic Air Command, SAC, watch for crisis situations over the entire globe. From here, they can reach every SAC base, missile silo, bomber, and airborne tanker in the world in seconds. The B-52 
52, workhorse of the bomber fleet for over 30 years, money well spent. They can each carry 12 nuclear missiles and be in the air in minutes. They do it to prove they can and to let Russian satellite intelligence know they can. <laughs> Only the president can authorize an actual nuclear attack by warmonger. The first people who would want, you know, who, who do not want to go to war, the crew said alert because we, you know, we are the first line of defense and we don't want to go. It's a breezy, dreary morning. 160 men, the crew of a billion-dollar Trident nuclear sub, the USS Henry M. Jackson, head up the Hood Canal on their way to sea, somewhere in the Pacific. Once submerged, they won't surface. They'll make their own fresh air, their own fresh water, disappear off the face of the Earth for over 70 days. Ship for periscope depth. Move the ship periscope depth, aye, sir. Time and aye, sir. Submerge the ship. Proceed to periscope depth. Raising number two, scope. Die, die. Die, die. Captain Fisher runs the ship. The crew takes on his personality. Quiet, efficient, calm. Huh. 10,000 grade. All vents coming shut. Primary cargo on this patrol, 24 nuclear missiles, over 18 million each, one in each of these reddish cylinders. If it makes you think twice about pushing that button. Who's they? The Russians. Brian, explain. Holy smoke. This is a normal nine-man bunk room. Most of the crew members sleep between the missiles in rooms like these. Little space, no privacy. About once a week, each man receives a family gram, a little note, 50 words or less, from home. So nobody, you can't talk back to anybody. No, we maintain radio silence the whole time we're out. But do, do most of the men on the ship know at any given time where they are? No, they don't. No, and that's on purpose. That's correct. Lowering number two, Skull. How deep do you go? Well, oh, that's classified also. How fast can you go? That's classified, too. Keep it all to yourself. The silent service. That's... The sonar room. A computer analyzes every sound, but it takes an expert human ear to identify that sound for sure. Is it a hatch slamming on a Soviet sub or a toilet seat falling in the captain's quarters on the Jackson? Signs warn against the dangers of feeding the bear, making noises the Russians could detect. It becomes a way of life, of thinking, quiet. On the nuclear carrier, Carl Vinson, being loud, being big, being seen is what they're all about. The word they use is presence. And nearly six billion dollars worth of carrier and planes can show U.S. presence and project power around the world like nothing else. You take a spot in the middle of the ocean that's uh, equidistant from the United States and the Soviet Union and you have a hypothetical conflict there, we can get there the fastest with the mostest, as they used to say. We've got some Air Force aircraft doing raids on us today. We don't know exactly when they're coming. And our job is to intercept them and simulate taking them out several hundred miles away. <laughs> and we do it. Or we read about it. And uh, winning is, uh, is the only important thing. Get out of that walk. Get out of there. Commander Bernie Hedger is the air boss in charge of the men on deck. 14 to 16 hour day is a normal day for these guys. And uh, the work is unbelievably hard. 
On deck, the color of a shirt signifies a job. Yellow, traffic cop. Green, catapult. Red, weapon, and so forth. It should be sheer pandemonium because of the amount of activity that one sees. What it is is the most finely orchestrated ballet of man and machine under all conditions of weather and light that I've ever witnessed. But there's more here than the majesty and power of man and machine. This carrier represents a major piece of our country's strategy, how to protect us. People can argue, and do, about what we need to be secure, how many ships, planes, guns, and personnel. But most agree we don't get full value for what we spend on defense, and too often it's the troops who have to pick up the slack. I don't think people in Washington understand exactly what we do. You know, they, they, brought, they got figures, they got money and, and all that stuff. You know, that's all, all they look at is what's on paper. And you got guys working 18, 20 hour days out here making less than somebody flipping hamburgers in McDonald's. But if they want to cut back, then, uh, you know, you got good people out here and you can make more money on the outside, so why stay? Why risk your life? You risk your life every time you go out there. Our people in uniform, most of them very young, are terrific, committed, disciplined, talented, truly the best they can be. Give them solid orders and the right tools, they'll get the job done. Most agree they deserve better leadership at the top levels of government. I think they can be a lot better, sir. But I think we can do better by them in terms of the weapons that we give them, both in quality and quantity, the kind of support we provide for them. Nobody likes to spend money on defense. I don't like to spend money on defense. The last people that want a war are military people. Uh, but we owe it to them to provide them with the adequate equipment, uh, adequate ammunition. And uh, it's been demonstrated time and time again that uh, weakness only invites aggression. And that, unfortunately, it isn't the kind of world that we'd like it to be. In West Germany, the U.S. Army watches the Czech border for any sign that something's up. Anything unusual is reported back to Camp Reed. Did they have any weapons with them or anything of that nature? Haben Sie dabei Waffen oder Pistolen? Nein, das haben wir nicht gewusst, weil die sind ja mit dem Hubschrauber geflogen. Und der Hubschrauber This mission is more conspicuous. A U.S. Border Patrol exchanges information with German Customs Police. This is the Iron Curtain. Here, the rules are simple. Blue tip poles on our side, red tip poles on theirs. You'll see there's an op a PS observation tower right there. That tower is usually manned, and more than likely, right now, they're looking at us with it there. Here, the threat is more real. World War II seems like only yesterday. Our young men watch and wait. sounds. Four M1 tanks roll out of Camp Reed, seven miles from the Czech border. It's a drill, part of our commitment to NATO, defend against the Warsaw Pact. We cannot afford the notion that we are in Europe as a favor to the Europeans. We are there because it's a vital interest to the United States. <laughs> There are over 700,000 American military and family members in Europe, about as many people as live in Indianapolis. Of course, you'd never get away with this in Indianapolis, tanks rolling through town, tying up traffic, rolling across farmland. You don't hear many complaints out here, though. 
what we're doing out here, we're paying for the price of freedom. There's no doubt about it. We put in long, hard hours, we train hard, and uh, every time we go on a patrol, you can see the end result. They're out there just as often. I find that uh, the soldiers and the leaders are very much aware of the, uh, of the threat they face. Uh, they know their enemy. Uh, they know the capability of their enemy. So I think you'll find a great awareness in Europe of the threat. You know, that, uh, uh, that border is not a long way off. This is called forward deployment, whether it's a lonely stretch of German farmland or the DMZ in Korea. The idea is to fight the war on their soil, not ours. Why would you ever file your weapon on the border? Only if the rules of engagement apply, sir. But it's incredibly expensive. Over two-thirds of our defense budget goes for military strength that would be used outside the United States. And we spend more on the NATO alliance than the other 15 NATO members combined. After World War II, only America was able to protect the entire free world. Well, not anymore. We have rich and powerful allies in Asia, Europe, and our part of the world. Many Americans think they should pick up more of the tab for defending freedom. Japan and Europe were feeling the effects of the war. They have recovered from that war, and they are now strong powers economically, and they've really got to contribute a lot more uh, to the common defense. We're still going to be the big guy on the block, but we're not going to be the only uh, person on the block. We're going to have to rely on a coalition strategy, both in Europe and in most other parts of the world. They call this camp The Rock. Here they can tear the place up without worrying about somebody's garden. They let the M1 tank do what it's supposed to do, run and gun. Two and a half million dollars a piece. Some say that's too much. But for that, you get 60 tons moving 45 miles per hour with a gyro-mounted gun that stays on target despite terrain, fog, or darkness. And like most of our newest weapons, it's a computer that makes it work. This ship is only part high-tech. The USS New Jersey, one of four World War II battleships brought out of mothballs. It works, but it's expensive to run. Almost everything is done by hand. What's good is an old battleship. Well, you know, we've got unbelievable offensive potential. And I'm not saying defense, I'm saying offense. We've got our long-range Tomahawk missile. We've got our shorter-range surface-to-surface harpoon missile. And then if they really want to get to us very close, we've got a thing called a 16-inch gun that was a uh, massive force in World War II and still is today. <laughs> General quarters, a drill, and big excitement for the men in the turrets of those 16-inch guns. Looks like standing on a train tracks and having a freight train come right at you. It's something like 3D coming right in your face and then leaving right back. Sort of controlled danger. Our captain always says it doesn't get any better than this. Into the chamber, the shell weighs about the same as the Volkswagen, and they can shoot at 23 miles. Accurate. Center gun, one round loaded. Right here, center gun, shoot! Shot Fire. Impressive. But when the smoke clears, the question is, do we need this ship at all? Or for that matter, MX and Midget Man missiles, Stealth, SDI, the other sophisticated new weapons. Since we're cutting back on defense spending, we need priorities. Which weapons and how many fit into our grand plan? Do we have a grand plan? There's a tendency to give the, the services the money and let them divide it up. You can't do that if you're going to have a coherent policy or a coherent strategy. The trouble is that, uh, like football teams, you become perhaps so loyal to your own team that you lose sight of the rules of the game. The burning question in defense has always been how much is enough. But you can't answer that question until you say enough to do what?
The Navy knew what it wanted from this ship, find the enemy over the horizon and protect the fleet, early warning. This is the USS Vincennes, preparing to go to the Persian Gulf, where later it mistakenly shot down the Iranian airliner. 290 died. The Aegis Cruiser, a billion dollars each, with its advanced radar, intelligence, and weapons system. We learned that high technology also needs good human judgment to protect us from disaster. Uh, Trump, well, this is a Royal Fox Air Roger. If you would like to relay this nation. We don't outnumber the enemy in people or pieces of equipment. So to make our odds better, we use smart weapons, high tech. Our survival could depend on semiconductors, those tiny little uh, computer chips that fit on the tip of your finger. This F-16 won't even get off the ground without its computers and its chips. Right now, we buy too many of them overseas. Within 10 years, if we don't change that, our ability to fight and win a war could be an Asian hand. From a defense standpoint, the danger is that we would have to depend on our allies, particularly Japan or Korea, uh, Taiwan, for a key element of providing our military capability. In other words, our ability to defend ourselves becomes dependent upon someone else. For a strong defense, we need strong industry. Here in the nearly mile-long F-16 factory, just about everything is high-tech. Some weapons cost too much, some shouldn't be built at all. But the Fighting Falcon's a defense success story, good jet at a good price, because the government and General Dynamics made a long-term deal. They manage it well, they share savings. And Fort Worth wins, too. Nearly three billion dollars pour through its economy each year. There are approximately 350,000 people employed with 5,000 companies. That's 300,000 in America and 50,000 overseas. So if the government said, we don't want any more F-16s, what's Ooh. the impact? Well, the impact is severe. The government has put tough new restrictions on all contractors because some were cheating. Ripping us off, bribery, kickbacks, overcharging, fraud. It starts with abuse. It starts with people misleading the Congress. It starts with the absence of a strategy so you have something to measure against. If you had a strategy and you started measuring budgets and resources against those goals, it would make an enormous amount of difference. But in the absence of a strategy, every weapon system seems to take on a life of its own. It doesn't fit into a bigger picture. And so we're all part of the process, and the Pentagon has to improve, and so do we. I think industry tends to be the scapegoat, the scapegoat both for the Pentagon and for the Congress. And it's an easy way out to blame waste, fraud, and abuse on industry for the kinds of problems that are, by and large, created within the government. Our industry, I think, is a reflection of the way the government does its business. Every 29 hours, another F-16 rolls off the assembly line. Now it's less complicated. A pilot, a plane, a purpose. The biggest thrill that I've ever experienced in my life. And it, the neat thing is, uh, it, it's always thrilling. Every time I get in, it's just as thrilling as last time. She flies like a dream, you know? Boy, that's incredible. My pilot, Dane White, Captain of the United States Air Force. Dane's mission this day, practice, bomb a bridge, air-to-air -air combat, become the sacrificial lamb in a dogfight. If we went to war tomorrow, we would expect the first thing to do would be to defend the airspace. Then we could go on to try to turn the tide of the war and really take uh, the, the war to the enemy and actually push them back.
You can see that the head looks like with the radar lock. TV box around the target. Gun sights and lag there that show how bullets are going because of the lead we're pulling. This is what the attack pilot sees through the gun camera as he dot across the cloud. Something like a home video game. Line up the variable. Gotcha. This is dangerous stuff. I mean, it's serious stuff. It's the other thing about that. You ever think about the dangers? Uh, we think about it all the time. In fact, we realize every time we strap the jet on and go fly, that it might be the last time uh, we see our loved ones. If we didn't do the right thing, we could have uh, smacked the ground. It's just not easy. It happens to uh, enough guys that we really respect the airplane. And also we respect the fact that when war comes, it's going to be even more lethal. Where do you go from here? It's hard to say. Hopefully it won't be away from the F-16. On the ground below, the 2nd Armored Division. Target practice on a range Rommel used in World War II. The day is miserable. They shoot anyway. A lot of the money spent on defense is well spent. We got our money's worth for people, for training, for many weapons that really work. But a tremendous amount of defense money is wasted. We're not talking about the hammers and toilet seats that cost hundreds of dollars, but tens of billions of dollars that could go instead for taking care of people or educating our children or reducing the deficit. And that's the tragedy of it. We're not providing the country with the defense that the country deserves. And we're spending more for it than we ought to be spending for it. 45 minutes ago, here at this border crossing point, at this former border crossing point, there was a PS border guard chief mm -hmm. with the major and three soldiers. The West German Border Patrol tells our troops that a Czech major has been watching this area with interest. Suddenly, a Czech jeep pulls up to the crossing. The second cavalry gathers around. Now that we plan to reduce the number of nuclear weapons in Europe, some leaders believe we might be spread too thin here. Because we don't spend enough? No, they say, because we don't spend smart enough. If things get rough, could we hold this line? Right now, there's doubt. What goes on here at the border is bizarre. A Czech major and his men observe us, observing them. The Czechs and our second cavalry stand a few feet apart and stare at each other. Are you allowed to speak to them? The procedures that we uh, we use here is to not make contact with them, uh, either speaking or gestures or whatever, because uh, that can be misinterpreted to uh, cause problems. What we try to do here is to be professional. We're what they see. You know, this is uh, when they see the U.S. Army, they see uh, this regiment, and so we've got to be the best. Our equipment's got to look good. Our soldiers have got to be good, and they are. Even if Gorbachev makes the tank and troop cuts he proposed at the UN, the Warsaw Pact will still hold a significant conventional force advantage in Europe. And conventional fighting is expensive. That's one of the reasons we decided decades ago to use a less expensive deterrent, nuclear weapons. Temperature at 640, 40 degrees. Because of the winds and the snow, a little bit of snow we had last night, make sure you watch the and the low lying areas be a little slippery out there. 8 a.m. The missile crews are briefed on everything from the condition of the road to the condition of the Minuteman missiles under their command. Captain Michelle McCain, 
and Lieutenant Vince McDonald are the crew for Charlie One. There's no way that you cannot think about the massive responsibility you have down here. Everyone who does this job from time to time thinks about it, and you'll find from time to time there are people that find that they can't do this job. Eight times a month, they drive one hour to this launch control facility known as Charlie One. There are security checks before they can get to the elevator that will take them below. Come on. How are you? Thank you. Good morning, this is Captain McCain, plus one, trip three for the day, off three. I am not under duress. I can vouch for the vehicle, the passenger, and all hand carried baggage. All right. No water leak. Okay. Work. 80 feet under Montana. This capsule was placed here over 25 years ago after the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is a shift change. Check the security seals on the equipment. Processor verifier. I have 73587. These are used to help us guard the critical encoder components in the launch control center. What they do is they provide us any evidence of tampering. If everything's okay, they're on their own. 24 straight hours together, locked in an underground vault. You still there? Okay. What I need you to do is, um, are you about to take the one on? In the capsule is a red box okay. containing the two keys it takes to make one launch vote. The launch controls are far enough apart so that neither person could turn both keys at the same time. Even if they could, another crew in another capsule would have to go through the same procedure simultaneously. It takes two launch boats to send up the 10 missiles under McCain's command. I made the decision that if I'm called to war, and if I have to turn those keys, I can do that. And if I didn't believe that and believe in what I'm doing, I wouldn't be here. No questions? Have you got any questions? No, I don't have any questions. All right, then let's press on with changeover. Just last year, a male-female crew like this was not allowed, but women are doing more and different jobs in the military every day. One person in ten in uniform is a woman. After a while, it sounds crazy, but after a while, you don't even look at each other as male and female. More than perhaps any other job in the military, the missile crew deals with public perception. It goes with the territory. You have two perceptions. One, it ranges from complete ignorance and complete um, animosity about what we do. People don't want to know to the people who think that we have fangs, uh, hunchback, and we drool. And I realize that's exaggerated, but people, I think, expect us to be slightly eccentric, a little bit crazy to be down here, as opposed to being normal. We look like everybody else. We're reasonably intelligent, well-spoken. I think fulfilling part about what we do, what's gratifying, is we actually don't have to do our job, that we maintain deterrence, which is our mission, so that we never actually have to do what we were trained to do. Skybird, just a looking glass. The back here board may have both the jets of the primary alert system. Acknowledge. They call this airplane looking glass because it's a mirror image of SAC's underground command center. The looking glass is uh, my alternate to where we're sitting right here. If we were vaporized, you and I here in a few minutes, I have a general officer airborne with a battle staff that's on that aircraft that will be able to take over for me. Roger, Command Center, this is Marigold. Uh, would you place your DDO on the line for me, please? Stand by for General Hawker. General Buck Schuler and his staff are in the air for an eight-hour ship. They fly only over the continental United States. They refuel in the air to stay airborne, alert, and in touch with the people manning our bombers and missiles around the world. Before this plane lands, an identical one with another general on board takes its place. A looking glass aircraft has been in the air 24 hours a day, 
for the past 27 straight years. The materials with which we would uh, execute, control the site force, are locked in the safe, and I have a key, and the ops controller has a key. Where do you keep the key? I keep the key around my neck. Roger, understand that, uh, understand seven bombers and three tankers, That's and right. uh, when will the uh, tankers recover from uh, Edwards? Our military leaders have to know that they'll have enough money to keep this plane in the air and maintain other capabilities for years to come. Now, they say that Congress is just too involved in the nitty-gritty of day-to-day -day Pentagon spending, that it keeps jerking the defense budget around like a yo-yo. Lots of money for a few years, then not so much money the next year. The military says that Congress will just provide a constant known amount for several years. The services will do a better job for less. The biggest problem we have in terms of waste in the Pentagon isn't $600 toilet seats. The biggest problem is the on-again, off-again nature of the funding. We ratchet up the spending one year and then cut it back the next. If we could somehow bring together a more business-like way of dealing between the Department of Defense and the Congress, uh, that we could give this country the defense that they deserve for an awful lot less than we spend on it every day. But what we have to do is focus on the, the, the huge waste, and that is inefficient production lines, lack of coordination between the services, duplication between our own military services, and duplication between allies. Members of Congress use defense spending to bring business dollars to their district, help them get reelected. But try to trim waste, they say, not in my neighborhood. Cancel a big weapons program? Absolutely. But not in my state. And try to close an unneeded military base, you bet, but not in my district. All too often, members of Congress look on a program, a, a weapon system or a base, as jobs for their district rather than something that's essential for national defense. Counseling even a dog around Congress is very difficult, let alone one that has any merit. It's extremely difficult. You've got jobs involved, you've got constituents involved. I don't think you can blame a congressman or a senator from trying to do something that his constituents want. Uh, the question then is, does the rest of the Congress have to go along with that? And the answer is no. There's a disease in defense called not my fault. If something goes wrong, it's not my fault, blame the other guy. The government points at industry. Industry points at government. The Congress blames the Pentagon. The military blames Congress. Until there's incentive and reward for doing a good job, until people get fired for doing a bad job, until high ups start holding other high ups accountable for spending too much of our money like it's play money, it's not going to change. What do you do when you're a civilian? I'm an assistant manager for the National Cable TV Corporation. Diesel mechanic. What did you think when you first heard you were gone? I really didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Change of scenery. Where you headed? On door. Army reserves from Pennsylvania are ready, more or less, for their two weeks a year active duty. You all right? Yeah. I guess I'm not as troubled as all of us. This will be home for the next two weeks, Camp Powderhorn. It's a joint operation with the Honduran Army. The mission, they say, is showing the flag and helping the Hondurans by building roads through the mountains. When we were there, there was conflict on the Honduras-Nicaragua border. Although these troops are 150 miles away, the U.S. commander, Colonel Casto, knows this mission is controversial. How much does this have to do with American support for the country? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it has nothing to do with it, because we're down here to build a road, and that's all we're doing. And we're also getting the best training in the world, so that's the most important thing, to train our people. People can disagree whether our soldiers should be in Honduras. But again, the bigger question, where do U.S. Army Reserves where do all the armed forces fit into our country's big plan, our strategy to defend the free world? The president and his advisors set our national security goals. 
and basically decide what's expected of the military. For years, that's meant being ready for every conflict from nuclear war to local crises on land, sea, and in the air, all over the world at the same time. Call order. Our admirals and generals say that's why they need so much money to get the job done. If we provide some stability, if we provide a coherent strategy, if we had a national consensus about what areas of the world are strategically important and, and which aren't, and if we gave them the kinds of resources, not a big increase, but stable, steady funding that would allow them to do intelligent planning, then I think we would see uh, how good they really are, and I think they'd be better than they are today. There is no defense strategy. I think that is very clear. We have no defense policy. Anything that's worth the, 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 the proper use of that term, it does not exist. It has not existed. Uh, it has not existed during the buildup, and it does not now exist during the, uh, the, the, the last couple of years of decline. I believe it is possible to actually increase the defense capability while making some cuts in defense spending. But knowing that's possible and having a plan to make it happen is two different things. In the military, there's a plan, a system, a procedure for virtually everything. On a carrier deck, even the tiniest scrap of debris is picked up so it can't get sucked into a jet intake. We get ready to launch in the F-14. I'll fly with Ray Rose, combat veteran, commander of the Sundowners. The squadron got that name from downing so many Japanese planes during World War II. The longer you stay in, uh, the more additional responsibilities you get, and so flying becomes an escape. You know, the pile paperwork starts piling up, and, you know, I'm Leah Cook, I'm not, you know. <laughs> I got in this business to fly jets, and all of a sudden, I turn around, and I'm not flying jets anymore, I'm pushing all this paper, get me out of here, give me a jet, and uh, I'm gone. I'm to fly taxi Check weight, wind velocity, and a hundred other variables. When we get the OK, we'll go from zero to 170 miles per hour in two and a half seconds. <laughs> We make the same basic sacrifice, whether it be peacetime or wartime. Nothing changes to that. That, I think, is important to understand. It's not like that every, everybody just kicks back and relaxes and has a good time waiting for the next war to start. It doesn't work that way. There's no way you can visit our troops around the world without being impressed with their quality. Flying impossible hours, refueling in the air, and flying more. Flying on their bellies in sub-zero temperatures. Closing themselves off from loved ones for long periods of time. For most, it's more than a living. They believe what they do helps protect our freedom, our safety, our choices in life. They believe it's all worth the sacrifice. The irony is that such a disciplined core is at the mercy of such an undisciplined system. Too many of our national leaders and politicians sensationalize defense, make extreme statements like, uh, if you're not for increased defense spending, you're on American. Or, uh, we don't need nuclear subs and rockets, feed babies instead. Press these it up, hot stories. Truth is, it's not either or. We need to do both, take care of people and defense at a place we can afford. Not a question of whether, but how. Starting with the president, you take the president who thinks this is an important issue for him, and he then makes it a high priority. It takes a secretary of defense who is determined to improve the operation of the way the Pentagon goes about buying things and enforces some discipline. It takes a congressional leadership that will focus on the big things that will, for example, go to a multi-year defense budget so you don't fight the same battles over again year after year. The ultimate judges are, are the American people, the electors, the, the folks who get to choose every two years or every four years who's going to run the country. It boils down to 
boils down to this. The person who lives here has to set clear and realistic goals, then demand that everybody do the job right. We need defense that works that we can afford, and we have the right to it because the cost is so high and the stakes are so great. Back at Camp Pendleton, the Marines finished the job, take the civilians to the evacuation chopper. The exercise took longer than it should have. To them, it's a warning. Next time, they'll do it better, faster. They'll have to. As always, it comes down to a soldier, a weapon, and the system that protects our country and gives our people in uniform a fighting chance of getting out alive. <laughs> Mike Lanusa is a reputed member of the Hangman Motorcycle Club. Three years ago, police discovered the body of a musician in the trunk of Lanusa's car. Get the clues to help find him on America's Most Wanted, the original Crime Watch series, hosted by John Walsh, tomorrow night on Fox. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.